Now, if you have your Bibles with you today, open them, please, to the 8th chapter of the book of Romans and the 20th chapter of the book of Proverbs. Find those two openings, if you will, please. Romans chapter 8 and Proverbs chapter 20. We'll be using more scriptures as we go along, but these two for our text. In fact, these two portions of Scripture will be our text for the series of lessons or this particular series that we'll be teaching on how to be led by the Spirit. First of all, in the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, we'll read two verses, verses 14 and then verse 16. Verse 14 reads, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Then the 16th verse said, For the Spirit itself, or himself, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Then turning to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Read in the King James translation, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Another translation reads, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. The lamp of the Lord. I suppose if you'd put that into modern speech, we could take one of our light bulbs and say the spirit of man is the light bulb of the Lord. In other words, what he's saying, that means that God will enlighten us and that God will guide us through our spirits. For the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. They had candles in those days, you know. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. Or using modern vernacular, I suppose if we'd been writing nowadays, we'd have said the, the light bulb. The spirit of man is the light bulb, the light, you see, that he uses to guide us. Let me say it again, that means that God will enlighten us and that he will guide us through our spirits. However, many times we seek guidance every other way except the way that God said that it's going to come. Well, I've always found out that you do a whole lot better if you'll just side in with God and get in line with his program instead of trying to get God to get in line with your program or to do it the way you want to do it. You see, a lot of times we judge how God's leading us by our physical senses, what our physical senses tell us. But nowhere does God say that he will guide us through our physical bodies or through our physical senses. Nowhere. Too often we look at things from a mental standpoint. But God, nowhere in the Bible does he declare that he'll guide us through our mentality or through our minds. God said that it's the spirit of man that's the candle of the Lord which means that he will guide us through our spirits, or he will guide you through your spirit. Now man is a spirit. He has a soul. And he lives in a physical body. He is a spirit being because he's made in the likeness of God. And Jesus, you remember, talking to the woman at the well of Samaria in the fourth chapter of John's gospel said that God is a spirit. And so if we are made in the likeness of God and God is a spirit, then of course man must of necessity be a spirit. When the physical body of man is dead and in the grave, the spirit lives on. 
that part of man is eternal because spirits can never die. And man is spirit, soul, and body. Praise God. Now you see, before we can understand how that God does lead us and guide us through our spirits, we have to understand the nature of man. And we have to understand this fact that man is a spirit. That he has a soul. And that he lives in a body. And as I said, when the physical part of our being is dead and put into the grave, the man still lives. Paul is speaking of physical death in Philippians, the first chapter. Notice what he said in the 23rd verse. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Now to show you that he was talking about physical death, he went on to say in the 24th verse, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Now notice that Paul is talking about physical death. He said, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Now, who's going to depart? I am. I'm going to be with Christ. Which, he said, is far better, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh. That means, abide means to live. Nevertheless, to live in the body. The flesh is the body. You could put it this way. Nevertheless, to live in the body. See, he's going to live, whether he's in the body or out of the body. He's still going to live. Nevertheless, to abide or live in the flesh or in the body is more needful for you. If he's here living in the flesh, living in the body, then of course he could teach the church at Philippi and could minister to them, could be a blessing. It would be more needful for them that he continued to live in the flesh. But he'd be far better, he said. Even if he'd said it's better, that'd have been good. But he said which to depart and be with Christ, which is far better as far as he's concerned. Now you see he was actually saying I'm going to depart. I'm going to be with Christ. Now who was he talking about when he said I I'm going to depart. I'm going to be with Christ. Well he wasn't talking about his body for his body wasn't going to depart. Thank God we will have a new body one of these days. Glory to God. And that'll be a great day. But Paul here is talking about the inward man or the spirit man that lives inside this body when he said, I'm going to depart. I'm going to be with Christ. You'll notice in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the 16th verse, writing to the church at Corinth, now notice we just quoted what he said to the church, just read what he said to the church at Philippi. Notice that he preaches the same truth, teaches the same facts to each one of the churches. He may use different words, but he is teaching the same blessed truth to the church. At Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, he said, but though our outward man perisheth, or as the margin said, is decaying, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Now here again, he's talking about the outward man, which is the flesh, the body, which is decaying, which is growing older. But he's also talking about the inward man, which is a spirit man that's not growing any older, that'll never be any older, that's being renewed day by day. Glory to God. Isn't that right? There is an outward man. There is an inward man. The outward man is not the real you. The outward man is only the house that you live in. The inward man is the real you. What is our spirits? 
Paul, you know, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, praying for the church at Thessalonica, said, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Son of Man. But now what is our spirit? You see, the text said that, uh, my text that I took to begin with said that for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And then the 16th verse gives us a little insight how the Spirit of God leads us because the, uh, the 16th verse said, but the Spirit itself or himself beareth witness with our spirits that we are the sons of God, children of God. Then the other text in Proverbs said, for as many as are, it said, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The spirit of man. So here we see that he talks about the spirit of God and he talks about the spirit of man. Bear, the spirit of God bearing witness with the spirit of man. And that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Before we can understand how God will guide us through our spirits. Because according to the scriptures that we read, that's the way he guides us. Then we must find out what our spirit is. That part of man that is spirit. Because as we quoted the verse from Thessalonians, he speaks about spirit, soul, and body. Now bear in mind that he did not say there in Romans that the Spirit of God bears witness with our bodies that we're the sons of God. He did not say the Spirit of God bears witness with our souls or our minds that we're the children of God. He said the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirits. He said the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. He didn't say the body of man is the candle of the Lord. He didn't say the soul of man, the intellect of man, the mind of man is the candle of the Lord. He didn't say that. He said the spirit of man. All right, what is our spirits? Well, let's just simply let the Bible tell us. Notice in 1 Peter 3, 4. You see, when Paul here in 2 Corinthians that we just read Fourth chapter and 16th verse is talking about the outward man that's decaying and the inward man that's renewed day by day. He's calling our spirits uh, the inward man. Now here in 1 Peter 3, 4, we find another expression about this inward man. Paul calls him inward man. Peter calls him hidden man of the heart but let it be the hidden man of the heart. I want you to notice that expression in this 1 Peter 3, 4. Hidden man of the heart. Man of the heart. Hidden man of the heart. So this inward man, as Paul calls him, or this hidden man of the heart, as Peter calls him, is really the spirit of man. This inward man, this hidden man, is a spirit man. He's not a mental man. He's not a physical man. He's a spirit man. When the Bible speaks of the heart... It is speaking of the spirit or the inward man or the hidden man. This is the real man. It'll help you in your believing and in your faith to think like that. It did me many, many years ago when I began to examine the Bible on this particular subject. If in the New Testament particularly, wherever the heart is used, if you'll just substitute the word spirit and think in mind, of the human spirit, you'll get a clearer picture of what he's talking about. Now this inward man 
is a spirit man. This inward man is the real you. Now, you can understand this verse in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter and the 17th verse. It will take on new meaning to you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, Paul writing again to the church at Corinth, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, Paul is talking about the inward man, the real you, the real man, when he said, therefore, if any man be in Christ. He couldn't be talking about the outward man. Because when you are born again and become a new creature, you do not get a new body. The outward man just like it was. We'll get around to the outward man in the minute. You have to do something with the outward man. God doesn't do anything with the outward man. You do that. God does something with the inward man. God doesn't deal with the outward man. You have to do that. Find out what God wants you to do with the outward man. Find out what God wants you to do with the body and do what the Bible said to do. God's not going to do it. Don't try to get somebody else to do it for you. You do it. No, when he said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's talking about the man on the inside that has become a new creature. We certainly, when we were born again, didn't get a new body. When you were born again, you did not get a, re a new body, but the real you the man on the inside became a new man in Christ Jesus, a new creature. Now I know this a lot of times in our discussing things. Our terms are so indistinct in describing things that we make it confusing to people. To me, it would just simply be better to say things the way the Bible says them. Not make the Bible fit our doctrines, but just make what we believe fit the Bible. Say it the way the Bible says it. Now, you know, for instance, a lot of times we have consecration services. That's fine if we know what we're doing. Dedication services. Christians come to the altar. We hear people say, well, dedicate yourself to God. Give yourself to God. Well, you see, this man on the inside, you can't give him to God. He, if you're a Christian, he already belongs to God. You can't give me something that already belongs to me. You couldn't give me that Bible case. It's already mine. You couldn't give me the Bible that's in the case. It's already mine. Isn't that right? You see, if you would say, when we have our dedication service and a consecrated service, if you'd come to do something with your body, that would be a different thing. But we don't make it clear, and so some folks have been doing the same thing. They've been dedicating and consecrating for 40 years, and they're no more dedicated and no more consecrated than they were 40 years ago when they started it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I've seen them having dedication, consecration services for Christians and saying, come into my heart. Well, if you're a Christian, he's already in your heart. He's not going to come in. He's already in there. And then they turn around and contradict themselves. I'm talking about consecration. I'm not talking about dealing with sinners. I'm not talking about an altar service for sinners. I'm talking about a dedication, consecration service. Everybody that had come forward were Christians. And somebody started singing, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay. <laughs> he had already come in to stay. And then I've seen him come back the next night and sing the same song. <laughs> same people. No wonder they never did get dedicated or consecrated. They didn't know what they was doing. Don't shout me down now just because I'm preaching real good. <laughs> it's so nonetheless. Now, as I said, our terms, let me re rephrase that or let me repeat it. Let me say it again. Our terms are so indistinct in describing things that they are confusing. 
It would be better for us just to say things like the Bible says them. Now, for instance, this verse that I quoted earlier in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, where Paul said, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here Paul is praying for the church at Thessalonica, and he begins with the inside, the very innermost part of man, the heart of his being, which is his spirit, you see, and then comes to the outside, spirit, soul, and body. He starts with the heart of man, spirit, then he comes to the outside, soul, and body. And so, he begins with the inward man and then comes out to the outward man. Do you ever notice this? I've watched this for many, many years. Most people misquote that verse. And they put the body first instead of the spirit. Because you see, they're more body conscious than they are spirit conscious. I've noticed that a lot of times even in in reading sermons that people had preached or, or messages in periodicals instead of them correcting the statement with the scripture, whoever edited the sermon, they go ahead and quote it just like whoever was speaking quoted it. And I've noticed actually, very seldom have I ever heard a speaker that got it correct. And I've been in the ministry for 43 years and I'm a very close observer. Very seldom, if ever, have I heard a speaker that really got it correct. They'd always say, Paul said, I pray God your whole body, spirit, and soul. He didn't say it that way. He didn't say it that way. Put the body first. He never put the body first. Spirit, soul, and body. Now, like I said, the reason that people say it that way is that they're, they're more body conscious than they are spirit conscious. But we need to become more spirit conscious. If we're going to be led by the Spirit of God, and if we know that God's Spirit leads us through our spirits, then we're going to have to become more spirit conscious or else we're going to miss the whole thing. Now we need to think of ourselves as spirit be beings, possessing souls and living in bodies. Now what is the difference from uh, or, or between spirit and soul? Now the spirit and the soul are not the same. And yet I know from experience, here's a hard one. For a good many years, I studied this subject. I, I didn't have the answer. I'll be honest, I didn't have it. It never has bothered me through these many years of ministry to say to people if they ask me sometime, I don't know. Don't let it bother you to say I don't know. Because if you know everything, then we ought to start following you because you're, you know. But really, we won't. We'll start praying for you because we know you're lying. <laughs> Amen. It never bothered me as a young minister when I first started out. Then there's a lot I didn't know then. There's a lot I don't know yet. Even the great apostle Paul said himself, in 1 Corinthians 13, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Now, if you'll just stop and think what he said, it'll help you. It won't hinder you, it'll help you. Paul said, I don't know everything. Even in my prophecy, I'm only prophesying in part. You'll never tell the whole story even in prophesying. It won't be the whole thing, everything. That's the reason you can't just follow it and nothing else. Are you listening to me? Because it's in part. Amen. But thank God for what we do know. Praise the Lord. Now then, I, I, I remember years ago, many years ago, I, I in, in studying this subject and then searching, and I asked different ministers, Full gospel, yes. Leading teachers in the full gospel Pentecostal movement. And then other ministers also. All outstanding ministers of the nation. I, uh, I, I got the teachings. The books that were taught in our leading 
Bible school, Pentecostal Bible schools, and some of the leading seminaries of our nation to see what they taught on the subject of man. None of them satisfied me. None of them were actually scriptural. They were, like the Bible said, in part. Most all of them. And then I asked outstanding teachers in the Assemblies of God movement, the leading teachers in the Foursquare movement, the leading teachers, and others in Pentecostal movement. Then I listened closely, very closely, to conversations as ministers were discussing some of these subjects. What's the difference between soul and spirit? And sort of a blank look come on his face. And he said, well, I always thought this was the same. That's exactly what every outstanding Pentecostal teacher in America said to me. I said, how could they be the same? How could they be the same? When Paul says, by the Spirit of God in Hebrews 4.12, that the Spirit of God is quick and powerful and sharper, then any two-edged sword dividing asunder spirit and soul. If you can divide them, they couldn't be the same. Isn't that correct? And I'll be honest with you, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't find the answer. And I'd been seeking for 15 years and studying carefully and burning the midnight oil. I could tell you some of the teachers that I asked. I'll not use any of their names. Outstanding teachers that I asked in personal conversation. They looked at me sort of blank and said, well, I thought they was the same. What's the difference between spirit and soul? I'd say, well, I thought they was the same. I said, well, I did too one time. Don't go back and get some of my old sermons way back out of years ago. You'll hear me saying the same thing they said. That's where I got it was from them. <laughs> but I found out I and them too was wrong. <laughs> you see. Now notice, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Now, we've not been able to divide them as we ought. I'll tell you why we haven't. Because we're more soul conscious than spirit conscious. Some are more body conscious. They put the body first. And they're more body conscious. Then others are more soul conscious. I made this discovery nearly 30 years ago as I began to study this. I've been studying it for 15 years. I began to make some of these discoveries in the last church I pastored way back 1948 and 49 as I just shut myself up in my church sometimes days at a time with the Bible. If anything I ever desired was, was to, to know the difference between the two. And uh, as, I, as I began to examine this, I found out this, that so many times in our full gospel circles, and I see the same mistake in charismatic circles today, they are more soul conscious than they are spirit conscious. And uh, what they call spirit, even the realm, if they don't term it that, the realm they're talking about, is the soul realm instead of the spirit realm. And the development a lot of times that they have is all in the soul realm, very little spiritual development. But it should not be hard. I, I, I came, I'll be honest with you before I go further with scripture here that'll help you to see something. I, uh, I just went through a process of elimination to discover because I couldn't find what the Bible was really saying because of my limited vision, spiritual vision at the time. I went through a process of elimination, just simply wrote it down. First of all, I wrote down, now I know this is a fact. With our body, with my body, that's the way I wrote down, with my body, I contact the physical realm. Now that goes without argument, that's, that's it. Then I knew this. With my spirit, I contact the spiritual realm. I wrote that down. Now, here's a scripture that helped me. It was in there all the time. Any Pentecostal person, any charismatic person, any spirit-filled person should know this. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray... 
in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now here, Paul is talking about his spirit, not the Holy Spirit. The Amplified Translation said, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit, within me prayeth. My spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Our understanding, our mentality is a part of our soul. I'm not praying out of my soul when I pray in tongues. I'm praying out of my spirit, my heart, my spirit, my innermost being. You remember what Jesus said over in John's Gospel, the seventh chapter? The last day of the feast, he stood and cried and said, Whoever wants the thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For he that believeth on me out of his belly. King James said, out of his belly. Another translation said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers, not a river, rivers of living water. Out of his belly. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe upon him should receive, for as yet the Holy Ghost is not yet given, because Jesus is not yet glorified. Now, hold that in your mind and read what he says here in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Then when I speak with tongues, the Holy Ghost, of course, gives me the utterance, but I do the talking. We need to settle that. I do the talking. He gives the utterance. That's where he is, is down here. It comes out of the inside of me. My spirit prayeth. Not my soul, my spirit. My understanding is unfruitful. My understanding is a part of my soul. My spirit prayeth. But my understanding is unfruitful. Pastor said to me, his wife said there, the time they said this to me, their daughters were grown and married, but said when their daughters were small, they just had two girls. One of them one night in a revival meeting received the baptism of the Holy Ghost or received the infilling of the Holy Ghost or was filled with the Spirit, either way you want to say it. And they said, uh, actually, others were praying around the altar and these little children were off by themselves. There's no adults over there with them. Holy Spirit just seemed to fall on them. This little girl, six years old, and in that day, they didn't start school. She hadn't even started school yet. They didn't start school till they were seven. So she didn't start school till the next year. But six years old. She ran up to her mother, holding her hand on her stomach, and said, Mama, Mama, said, that come right out of my belly. <laughs> she was talking about the tongue, she said. That little girl was sharper in things of the spirit than some full gospel pastors I know. <laughs> Amen. That came right out of my belly. That's what the Bible said, out of your belly. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. See? Amen. Out of your innermost being. That's, that's the spirit of man. Now, it's necessary for us to know the difference between soul and spirit and to locate the spirit because let's go back again now to see, to, so you can see that, that he is going to guide us through our spirits. then the more conscious we are of our spirits, the more we know about our spirits, the more guidance we'll be able to receive. The less we know, the more soul conscious, the more body conscious we are, then we're going to miss this spirit part altogether. That's really so hard for people to get some things. They're living so, so in their bodies or living so in their, their soul realm. Now, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Our understanding is a part of our soul. Remember I said I went through the process of elimination. I knew that it was with my body I contacted the physical world. I knew that it was with my spirit that I contacted the spiritual world. Then that left one, only one other part of me that made any other contact or contacted any other world. Then I knew that it had to be with my soul I contact the intellectual world. 
then that helped me to see. As I wrote that on the piece of paper, then I could understand. Now, Paul said, my understanding is unfruitful. I didn't pray when I prayed with, with tongues. I didn't pray out of my soul. I didn't pray out of my intellect or my mind. That wasn't my soul praying. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Then it ought to be comparatively easy for we who are spirit-filled to locate the spirit, my spirit prayer. Then that's our spirits where those tongues come from down there on the inside of us. Praise God, they don't come out of our head. We know that. Amen. We speak them out physically, all right, but they didn't come in the, out of the physical senses. Is because we yielded our tongues to our own spirits. And the Holy Spirit in our spirit gave us utterance. Now then, let's go back to this expression then. Here in Proverbs 20, 27. Let's go back and look at that expression again. In the light of all I've said, I think it'll take on new meaning to us. Now notice that. The spirit of man... Remember now, hold your mind. Paul said, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Now there's that word belly again. There in John's Gospel, the seventh chapter that we've already quoted, the 37th through the 39th verse, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus is not yet glorified. Now as a result of receiving the Holy Spirit, are being filled with the Holy Spirit, out of the belly shall flow rivers of living water. Another translation reads, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Again, let me remind you, I want to go over the ground carefully. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, I'm going to read the Amplified translation. This time I read the King James, I referred to the Amplified translation momentarily there. But the King, the Amplified translation reads, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prays. When you pray in tongues, it comes out of your innermost being, out of your belly, or your innermost being, or out of your spirit. That's where it comes from. And because you've received the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who resides in your spirit is giving your spirit the utterance and you're speaking it out. Therefore, when we read, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly, we see that the spirit of man is our innermost being are the real man. Now you can understand something else and see it more clearly. All the leadings that I've ever gotten have come out of my spirit. And most of them have come when I was praying in other tongues. You could understand why. Because you see, your spirit's active. Little side thought. One reason that we fail so miserably in the church world as a whole, we've done so much of just one kind of praying. Praying with our understandings, mental prayers. We've endeavored to fight spiritual battles with mental abilities. Instead of praying out of our spirits. instead of praying out of our spirits. I have found out this through these many, many years. In every crisis of life, in every crisis of life, 
I'm learning to look to my spirit inside me. I'm learning to pray in other tongues. And while I'm praying in other tongues, there comes guidance up from the inside of me. Because, see, my spirit's active. My body's not active. My mind's not active. My spirit's active. And it's through my spirit that he's going to guide me. And sometimes while I'm praying in tongues, I don't know a word is said in English. Sometimes I'll interpret it, and through the interpretation, I'll get some light and some guidance. But most of the time, not so, just once in a while. But many times, just while I'm praying in tongues, from somewhere way down in here, it'll just come up. It's difficult to explain spiritual things in natural ways. But it'll just rise up in me. It's just like you can sense something rising up in you. It begins to take shape and form. And you couldn't tell anybody mentally how you knew it to save your life because you understand don't have anything to do it. But you know exactly on the inside of you. It's, it, it's such an encouragement because, see, you know if you do face another crisis, you know where your help comes from. You know how to get it. Are you listening to me? Now, now, every time in my own life, since I was healed and since I was born again, since I'd become a new creature and then filled with the Holy Ghost, if sickness came my way, and we oughtn't to take these things lightly, friends. If, if sickness came my way, and, and several times, to be exact about it, three different times in these, since I was healed, 1934, three different times, deaths actually come and fast itself upon my body. I won't have time to go into detail in all of them, but I remember I left my last church Went out on the field, field ministry, 1949. Well, uh, you set out to obey God. Don't think it's strange that every devil of hell will be turned loose on you. <laughs> because if the devil can keep you out of the will and the plan of God, then he's thwarted to some extent God's will for you and God's plan that would bless others, particularly if you're in the ministry, you see. And I'll be honest with you, in seven-month period or a few months period, a five month period, I fought more devils and more demons and more evil spirits than I had in 15 years of ministry put together times three. <laughs> Multiplied by three. It seemed like all of them dogged my tracks. And I, no one relishes being gone from home just as a young man, early 30s, 32 years of age, Children left at home. My wife have to assume all that responsibility. And I just decided that it was too great a price to pay. And so I, uh, I decided that I'd go back to pastoring. I decided that. <laughs> you see. And so I, uh, I canceled out my meetings at a convention I attended. I knew there were other vendors there. And if it, uh, I said it to the... One's where I was supposed to go. If it wouldn't miss put you, I'd just like to cancel. What are you going to do? I said, I'm going back to pastoring. I did hold one meeting after this convention because that would be too close a pastor already had advertisement out. I didn't want to miss put him. Remember this, if you're a Christian, you always want to be ethical. You want to be a gentleman. Realize this, that you want to walk in love whether anybody else does or not, and love always considers the other person before me. No matter how you are misput and put out, if you really walk in divine love, you'll consider the other person no matter what it costs you. And if every pastor said, no, you come on, I'd gone to every one of them. I've got to do that to keep my word. It's no wonder to me to some of you folks' faith never amounts to anything. Your word's no good. You won't keep your word. Your faith never will amount to anything. If you don't learn to be a man or a person of your word. Because, you see, to get faith to work for you, you've got to believe in your words as well as believe it in your heart. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. I'm telling you the truth about it. <laughs> Amen. Mark 11, 23 said, Whosoever shall say and not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Those things which you say are words. Well, you're certainly not going to believe your words will come to pass when you're acquainted with your words and you know you're not a man or not a person of your word. I want to say it again. I've said it before. I'm going to keep on saying it. 
The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that one of the characteristics of, a, of the spiritual pilgrim is one who swears to his own hurt and changeth not. He won't change. If I tell a person I'll do something, if I tell a pastor I'll do something, if a man has my word for it, if he won't let me out of it, if I tell him now God's leading me this way and he said, no, you come on here, I'll go on there. God told me to do that. Are you listening to me? I'm going to keep my word. If I don't keep my word, it'll affect my whole spiritual life. You need to be careful about telling somebody something if you don't believe it. Are you listening to me? Whether you realize it or not, it'll absolutely affect you. I'll tell people the truth every time. I won't tell somebody I'm glad to see them if I'm not glad to see them. I'm not going to start lying. I won't tell them I'm not glad to see them. I'll find some way to say it without violating my conscience. I'm not going to tell somebody they're pretty if they're not pretty. Amen. I'm not going to lie. Say what you want to, it'll affect your faith. Well, that's just being nice. No, it's not. That's being devilish. Your faith won't work because after all, you won't believe in your own words yourself because you never kept your word with anybody. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. <laughs> Amen. Sure get quiet, don't we? <laughs> get down where you're living. It's all right if we're talking about the other fellow, but if we get talking about you, you don't get to meddling a little bit. That's something else. <laughs> Let's see, where were we here in our Bible lesson? Anybody remember? <laughs> well, I, well it, was, well, it was all right with each pastor, so I canceled out. They got him another evangelist. I went ahead and held this other revival for three weeks after this convention. And then I, uh, I had to set up to go preach on a certain Sunday to a certain church. Good church. Strongest church financially, full gospel church in that part of the state. Only one church ran more people than they did. So person-wise, it was second largest church in that part of the state. But financially, it was the biggest one. They paid their pastor the most. They had the most money. They did the most for missions of anybody else. The board said to me, oh, Brother Hagin, I don't know you held a revival. It really may not be necessary for you to come preach, but some of the, we've got some new ones in since you was here a couple of years ago to hold a revival, so come preach for us on Sunday. But the board said to me, we'll just almost guarantee it. You see, Brother So-and-so, one of the farmer pastors that you preach for, he recommended, whoever he recommends, well, you know, I mean, if you want it, well, you've got it. But I had one Sunday off before I go there and preach. So on this off Sunday, my wife and I went over to visit a neighboring church in a neighboring town. I'm sitting in the Sunday school class, and I can tell you exactly what the lesson was about that Sunday. <laughs> pastor had this Sunday school. They tried to get me to teach it. I wouldn't teach. Two other pastor preachers were there, ordained ministers, and they wouldn't teach. We said, well, we'll help you. You go ahead and teach it. You didn't know we was coming anyway. We just slipped in on it. The lesson was about Moses and the children of Israel. About Moses disobeying God and smiting the rock twice, you know, instead of what? <laughs> well, I'm pretty well authority on disobeying God, you know, because I just got through disobeying him. <laughs> you know, I decided. And so I'm sitting there while the Sunday school teacher, while the pastor's teaching this class, and I'll tell you the truth about it. I, I had my heart stopped beating right in my bosom, and I fell off the pew right in the floor. I barely was able. One of, I really started to get up when I passed out and fell. I, I managed to get my hand up under my nose just to keep mashing it on the floor. <laughs> and I did temporarily pass out, just blanked out, just went out. I pitched out right there at the, at the pastor's feet. Well, he reached down and picked me up. And these other two preachers sitting there on the front pew, they jumped up and lifted me up on the seat, you know. And, and uh, 
set me down and I said, uh, and they, everybody started praying and I said, take me, I, I, I began to feel no better fast. And I said, I, you know, one of the pastors, come go with me, you know, take me out to the parsonage next door. And they virtually carried me out there and I laid down the bed there in the, in the parsonage and uh, I said to this minister with me, feel my heart. Now it started up again, it stopped, it just flat stopped. But when it started up again, it wasn't, a, you couldn't distinguish any beats. It was racing evidently, just, I mean, you could, uh, you, you, you could actually put your finger in here and my neck, you couldn't feel a beat, you could feel the puff, you couldn't feel a beat. If you felt over my heart, you could feel a little something just quivering, that's about all. And I was getting cold all over. And so I, I said to them, feel my heart. When he felt my heart, he started crying. He ran out and got these other, the other preacher and the pastor, and they came on. He said, feel me his heart, and they fell to my heart. And, and they started crying. They said, lady, we just knew you was dead. <laughs> Well, I began to pray in other tongues. <laughs> and on the inside of me, way down in my spirit, it just, something just rose up in me, enlightenment. It began to take shape and form, and I, I knew, of course I knew in a sense already I'd missed God, but I saw how badly I'd missed Him. How I'd gotten disobedience and got on the devil's territory where he could attack me. No, God didn't send it on me. And I said to the Lord, Lord, all right. I promise you, among other things in my prayer, I said, I promise you this. Long as day I live, I'll never entertain the idea of pastoring a church again unless you put it into me. I won't entertain it in my mind at all unless you put it into me. Now, I knew I had my part done. I had my part done. But then there rose up something else in me. And I knew on the inside of me, inward in light, but you see that my wife had a part to do. I didn't know, she hadn't said a word to me. I said to one of the preachers, one, get my wife quickly. Well, he ran out to the Sunday school building next door, went to the ladies' Bible class and looked in, and already the Spirit of God had, had alerted my wife. She didn't know why, but I'm talking about being led with the Spirit. On the inside of her, she had this alarm. She knew, didn't know how she knew, but she knew something was wrong with me. And she was already gathering up her Bible and her purse and her Sunday school book and getting ready to leave the room, see, when she saw this gentleman came in motion to her. Well, he told her something of what happened. So she came to the room and fell down on the bed and said, Dear God, fell down by the side of the bed and, I, and put her hands on me and said, I, I feel like it's my fault. Well, I could see then. The Lord didn't tell me. He, I, he just, I just knew I had to get her to come stand with me. And she said, I feel like it's my fault. Now, she hadn't griped to me. She hadn't fussed to me. She hadn't said one word of discouragement. She hadn't had, had one word that would leave the thought that she's not going along with me 100%. But she said, I feel like it's my fault. I feel like maybe he wouldn't have wanted to pastor and quit the field if it hadn't been for me. Because in my heart, see, God knows what's going on on the inside of you. I can't see that. You can't see that. In my heart, I resented the fact that he was gone and I'm here with all the burden to raise the children and the family, you see, the two children. And... Uh, one day the children had got off to school and I was washing the breakfast dishes, you know, and, and on the inside of me murmuring like this. And, and I heard this voice say, I could take him where he never would come back. And she said, no, I didn't know this. She never told me. It came revelation to me. All I knew was just the Spirit said, you know, to get her, to have her to come. And she said, I looked all through the house. Looked behind the door, see if somebody was in there. See, to her it was audible. Looked in the bathroom, looked behind the bathroom door. And I checked the doors and the screens are hooked so couldn't nobody got in the house. And I passed it off as my imagination playing tricks on me. She said, Lord, that was you that spoke to me that day in an audible voice and said I could take him where he never would come back. Now I promise you this, Lord, that I'll never complain. I'll never feel badly on the inside of me again no matter where he goes, if you call him to go to Africa, no matter how long he's gone, if you'll just spare him. Well, I'd already made my, prayed my prayer and made my dedication. Now she had made hers. And the Spirit of God in me called these men, these ministers present as a witness to our dedication, to my wife's consecration. And the power of God fell on me and I leaped off of the bed while my heart still wasn't reading. I just danced all through the house. It was perfectly healed. <laughs> 
My wife and I had to, my wife had to make the same consecration dedication I did or I'd have died, I'll be honest with you. I said, did God kill you? No, God didn't kill me. I got in disobedience and we both got in disobedience. We got on the devil's territory. He can attack us. But I got back in a hurry. But I found through the years, every single time I've got there, and I've been there three times when death came fast and set upon me. But every time death came, something immediately on the inside of me rose up, and the Spirit of God immediately gave illumination. The Spirit of man, the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. God lit that candle. Praise God, just like a light come up on the inside of me. And I see, I knew immediately, I knew immediately everything I ought to know and why it was that way and what to do about it and how to get out of it. And I got out of it in a hurry. And you can too. He didn't say the spirit of the preacher is a candle of the Lord. He didn't say the spirit of the prophet's a candle of the Lord. He didn't say the spirit of the apostle is the candle of the Lord. He didn't say the spirit of the pastor is the candle of the Lord. He said the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The spirit of man. That concludes this message. For more information about Kenneth Hagen Ministries, call 1-888-283-2484 or visit our website at www.rhema.org or write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Post Office Box 50126, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74150-0126. And in Canada, write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Post Office Box 335, Station D, Etobicoke, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M9A4X3.